Melbourne's midfield Bulls help the Demons secure a preliminary final berth. And we show you how a power gun took Friday night's final away from the Cats. All that and more to come from the final so far brought to you by Amy. But Kane Corns, we start in Launceston. The big story, the Giants' elimination finals thriller over Sydney. Three straight in finals against their crosstown rivals. Yeah, what a rivalry they are building. Look at the scenes there. Toby Green's going to be the story out of that. Clearly, we'll get to that. He kicked three and was really important. It wasn't a massive afternoon for him, but there was a tsunami coming late in the last quarter. 17 to 8 inside 50s. The Swans had so many opportunities, but he, in the end, like that 2019 prelim final that you referenced, they were good enough to hang on. They defended for their life. And what a season it's been. Like for Leon Cameron and this group, whatever happens from here is an absolute bonus with the injuries, with the situation that they found themselves in and for their ability to dig in against the odds. They're building a phenomenal football club in Greater Western Sydney. The Giants are through to a semi-final against Geelong. Jeremy Cameron up against his former side for the first time. But the big headline is going to be whether Toby Green is there or not. This happened on the three-quarter time siren, Kane. Contact with Matt Stevick. This is going to be uh, looked at forensically over the next 24 hours. It will be. Uh, there's a simple solution to this. Everyone's overlooking the obvious. We're all trying to judge it from looking at our camera screens. Just go and ask Matt Stevick. I mean, you, you'll break it down for me in a minute what it means and which gradings will be off to the tribunal and which won't be. Matt Stevick has umpired over 400 games and eight grand finals. He, he's umpired over 45 finals. Just go and ask him if it was demonstrative, what the contact was like, how forceful it was. Was he offended by it? Was he shocked by it? Just ask him because I don't know and I can't see how significant the contact was. I could make a case that there was hardly any contact whatsoever. Michael Christian, bring up Matt Stevick and ask him, grill him, and then he'll be the one that decides whether it goes straight to the tribunal or whether it's a fine. No doubt he will ring Matt Stevick. Then Michael Christian's got two decisions, Kane. One, was it intentional contact? And if so, that falls into the aggressive, forceful, demonstrative or disrespectful bracket. Or secondly, does he decide that it was unnecessary or unreasonable contact? They're the decisions Michael Christian has to make. Now, we want to show you two comparable incidents from earlier in this season. Firstly, Toby Green against Carlton. Uh, earlier this season, uh, second half of the year. This is when he makes contact with Jacob Mollison. Now, the match review looked at this. They threw this out. They didn't feel that it was unreasonable contact. They felt that was given the all clear. Then this with Lockie Neal earlier in the season, trying to let umpire Matt Nichols know that he's got the blood rule. He received a fine for $1,500. That was deemed unreasonable or unnecessary contact. Yeah, you can, I can look at it both ways. I can see you know, similarities between the Neal one. I think it was a little bit more than the first Toby Green one that you showed, but once again, it is the easiest solution here. Put your trust in Matt Stevick and he'll give you a good indication of how forceful and, and how he saw the incident. If he was offended by it, if it was a really hard knock, if he thought it was unnecessary and unwarranted, send it straight to the tribunal and, and Toby Green's in trouble. If not, he gets a fine and plays next week. I think more likely my gut feel heading to the tribunal if he deems it the disrespectful uh, category, but we'll find more of that on uh, Sunday night when Michael Christian reveals those findings. Back to the game. Absolute thriller of a last quarter. The Giants, they led this one by 29 points in the third quarter, Kane. But the Swans, they came hard in the final term, kicking two goals, seven. Yeah, it was amazing that the Giants hung on. And the two goal sevens, the bit there, I mean, Heaney was absolutely enormous. I thought Sydney were far too buddy-centric in the first half, and that was what I was concerned for them leading into the game. Yes, he kicked three in the first half, but Taylor did a pretty good job. Once they changed it up and they targeted Papley and Heaney and others in the second half and they got the ball to ground, they look much more dangerous. But, I mean, these are the, the opportunities that they have missed that ended their season. One of these goes through then their season is alive and the reinforcements are coming with perhaps Mills and Kennedy and the like that they didn't have today. But it was phenomenal defending from the Giants. I mean, they've done that before. Can't believe they hung on. I'm not sure how they did it. I thought they made some mistakes late. They kept going out to that side with their kick-ins. They were far too predictable. That effort there from Toby Green when the game was on the line with 15 seconds is what... That's why he's the captain of this team. I know, I know Stephen Canelio tosses the coin, but Toby Green's the captain of this side. Canilio was ineffective once again. There'll be a decision with him to be made at selection. But those um, uh, examples there is why Toby Green should be the captain of this team from now on. The Swans dearly miss Josh Kennedy and Callum Mills and the Giants show them up 
at stoppages. They kicked four goals direct from clearances. Kane, three of those in the forward 50. Now, well, this is what really cost them as well. I mean, it was always going to be the Giants' strength. Where we're seeing uh, Warner there, he just gets the ball goggles on. You're playing on one of the most dangerous players in the game. I know you're inexperienced. I know you're a young player, but you've got to stew over that for a summer. So those four stoppage goals, three of them from their forward 50, it drives coaches insane because you've got the extra number there. You should be able to defend that. And three goals in a final is a massive number from forward 50 stoppages. That one there from Himmelberg was just given far too much space again. So these are the things that John Longmire sitting on the bench. I, you know, I wonder whether he would have been better perched up from the coach's box. I'm just not sure how much you can see at ground level. Who am I to tell John Longmire how to coach? He's been such a good coach this year, but they're the ones that he'll sit through over the summer. It's going to be a long one and think what could have been. And he was shattered post-game. We have to wait until next year for Buddy Franklin to come back and try and get his 1,000-goal tally. To Adelaide tonight, neutral territory, but it meant little for the Demons, Kane. They got the chocolates. Christian Matraka with two goals in the final term to seal this one. Pandemonium uh, for those Melbourne fans watching from home. Yeah, well, it was fitting, wasn't it? I mean, that, that's just such a strong performance. It was never in doubt. It was, it was an emphatic one. I know Brisbane at times late in that third quarter had their opportunities, but Melbourne have got their game in the best order out of anyone for, from defensively, offensively, and from their midfield contest stuff. And now that you didn't have the week off in the lead up to the finals, this week off becomes so vital. It, it's what the, the finals scenario should look like from now on. It's a much fairer situation where you actually reward the teams that finish in the top four and are good enough to win the qualifying final. And for Melbourne, who now go to Perth, I mean, how vital is that week off going to be for them? We'll get to Port Adelaide, but similarly for them. So there's no scenario that you see Port Adelaide and Melbourne not progressing now through to meet each other in the grand final now that the final situation is so much fairer than what it's been in the last five, six, seven years. Nine Demons playing their first final tonight. Petrarca did the business at the end, but our final star was Clayton Oliver. His first half was phenomenal. Kane, talk us through this because he's gone forward and really hit the scoreboard and provided his team teammates with opportunities in front of the footy. He's a different player. I, th I think he's the best pure midfielder in the game right now. What he has done is improved a number of facets of his game. His running power now is, well, it's extraordinary. The way that he can burst out of stoppage. He looks lean. He looks fit. He, he's definitely lost a few kilograms in the off-season along with Christian Petrarca. And this is his ball use tonight. It was exquisite. His touch and feel with his kicking. He had four direct goal assists, Mitch, to go with 18 contested possessions, seven clearances, 10 score involvements. He's the coach's player of the year for a reason. And he may just be a Norm Smith medalist or the Michael Tuck medalist is the best finals player because his performance tonight against good competition. I mean, Petrarca was great and Lever will get to in a moment, but he set it up for them right from the start and it was fitting that uh, he was the player of the night. There's a big moment early in the first term. The Lions already without Eric Kipwood Kane. Dan McStay, one of their key pillars, goes down with this nasty incident. Friendly fire from Nakaya Cockatoo. And from this moment onwards, the Demons' key defenders, they were always going to pose a problem, but it got harder for the, uh, for the Lions to contain them from this point. Yeah, so to lose McStay six minutes into the game, I mean, it just throws your forward structure out. And every time the ball went in like that, Brisbane didn't look like it. Uh, they took five inside 50 marks. They were 30 marks down on average from what they are for the year. Melbourne were just able to restrict them. The only time they looked like it was when the ball hit the ground in their forward line and Charlie Cameron kicked five. But just look at the way Melbourne here set up the ground. I mean, what are you going to do there? How are you going to penetrate there? All you get is a rush kick with the pressure coming frontally and Birchall wax one up in the air for Max Gorn to take another mark. They were so well set up tonight. I thought they defended as good as I've seen any team defend. But that's what they've done all year. So, so the year and the home and away season gives you clues. So let's not forget that they've been the best defensive side all year. So why wouldn't we think they're going to be the best defensive side throughout the finals? I just thought structurally how disciplined they are, how connected they are as a group in defense. I mean, we know defense wins finals and, and that was on display tonight again to restrict Brisbane like they did tonight, who have been the best attacking side all year, was a remarkable effort from Simon Goodwin and his players. Jake Lever had 11 intercept possessions in the first half alone. He was huge tonight. On the flip side, Harris Andrews missed last week with a hamstring. Just didn't look his normal self tonight, did he? 
No, it was one of the worst games I've ever seen him say, a player. And I, I don't want to be brutal about this, but you just got to be better. Vice captain, highly paid player, and his contest work tonight and the way that he defended, that, that's the ball is 50 metres away. Let's not play 20 metres in front. I thought the way that they exposed him with Ben Brown and Jackson on the leg, once again, there he's giving two or three metres. It's always a leg rope with Harris Andrews. He's trying to predict the ball and play it on his terms. At some point, you're a big guy. You can see the frustration there. You've got to defend one-on-one. -on -one. If there's a spoil like that, you've got to put your fist through the ball like we know that he can and spoil it 30 metres, but he sat off once again. And they were so conscious of going through Ben Brown, so uh, Harris Andrews' man through Ben Brown. No contact there. You let him run up and jump at the ball. I thought it was a really poor display. So he's either injured and he doesn't play or he's really disappointing. He can look that he can look lazy at times when he plays. We know he's a good player, but tonight I thought right from the start, he was so far off his game and that set the tone for the rest of his side. Charlie Cameron kicked five goals, threatened to take the game away from Melbourne at times, but uh, they lost the game. They will play the winner of Essendon and the Western Bulldogs in a semi-final next week at the Gabba. Time for our Amy Clangers this weekend. Kane, we've gone a throwback to the first week of finals of yesteryear. How about this from Paul Salmon, a champion at two clubs. Didn't enjoy this in his second last game after kicking a goal. Nothing worse than getting the cramp. Oh, we've all been there. You feel like you've been shot and he grabbed it there. What a player he was across two clubs, as you said. He had to come off and get a little bit of a rub. But do like going retro. Look at the crowds there. Yeah, don't we miss that? Yeah, 20,000 is good in Adelaide, but it's not like this. The Birdman got upstairs for the Crows. Couldn't he do this as well against Brisbane at the Gabba? Nice sit on Justin Lepich there, but... Mitch, he didn't finish too well. The Birdman was Jeremy Howe before Jeremy Howe was Jeremy Howe. And he put that uh, Mrs. Gary Ayres, coach of the side at that point, not too happy, Kane. And this should be regulation for Aaron Davey, the flash. He shouldn't be missing these. And the fan in the crowd just enjoyed this one a little much. Yeah, well, this is you. So, <laughs> so this is you in 30 years' time. You're a Geelong man. That's the reaction that you'd get with your nice little hat. I can see you sitting in the crowd in 30 years time but retro Amy Clangers magnificent finals theme today love that we'll have more of those throughout the final series to come not much enjoyment for the Cats fans back on Friday night though Kane the power seven wins on the trot they booked their prelim berth and this was really uncharacteristic from the Cats with these sort of efforts in their back half the power Didn't small forwards the pants on it yeah, yeah. Port Adelaide six minutes into the game their, their, their small forwards just went to work it was a blessing with all due respect to George Yardis, who's been such a good player, third in the rising star, that he did hurt that hammy because it allowed them to not only get the offensive output from Motlop and Fantasia will get to, but the pressure that they were able to apply. I just haven't seen Geelong this rattled. I mean, there's Rowan, who's on Marshall. What's he even doing in the back line for a start? We'll get to him in a moment and his form. This is Dangerfield. This is a Brownlow medalist doing that and allowing Port Adelaide just to mop that up. And Fantasia, he's one of the best finishers in the game, doesn't get enough credit for his work. I'm glad that came off. It was a risk to play him, but Ken Hinckley did. Everything they did, every way that they've built their list and their selections and the way that they've built into the season worked. And it was an emphatic performance. I watch all of their games, Port Adelaide, clearly with a, with a strong focus, more so than any other side. It's the best I've seen them play all year. It was comprehensive. Their game's in really good order. And I thought it was a masterclass from the coach's box. Last time I was on this show, round 13, I said Chris Scott out, coach Ken Hinckley. Ken Hinckley pulled his pants down from the coach's box on the weekend. It was a phenomenal display. And I want to show you some examples of that when we highlight Aaliyah in a moment. Well, let's get to that now. We almost felt last year speaking on this show, this was the final piece of this Port defence, a big key defender that could take the game away from oppositions. Take us through what you saw at the ground. So what they did, they would have been expecting Geelong Ali to have to play on one of the, the tools or the dangerous players who kicked 12 against them last time. So Rowan, Cameron or Hawkins, but they didn't do that. Burton went to Rowan, which would have surprised them. Ali went to the least dangerous Geelong small forward and he just showed them no respect. But that small forward would usually get up the ground to get out the way of uh, Hawkins and Cameron, but he couldn't do that because he had to watch Ali. Then they made the change. So they sent Gary Rowan to tag Ali. Look, Gary Rowan's going over the back. Now, at that moment, you've got to defend Alir. That's your job. You're not getting an easy one out the back and falling over and Alir comes off and he almost plays like the forward. That set up a goal for Port Adelaide. But five intercepts in the first quarter, three contested marks. He was phenomenal. And they had no answers for them. 
And their fourth line was rattled on the back of that. I thought Brett Montgomery, who's looking after Port Adelaide's defence, and Ken Hengley had a magnificent nine in the coach's box. And I reckon in that same corresponding game earlier this year, we spoke about Radical Lear pushing forward and we sort did. Of out, out marking uh, the power defenders, m- making Jonas accountable. And it was a completely different story back on Friday night. Chris Scott spoke about his diabolical pressure in the forward half. They only laid three forward 50 tackles on the night. And as a result, Kane, their woes in front of the big sticks continued in qualifying finals. They're now one and six in qualifying finals since that premiership in 2011. Just the one win there highlighted in green. And the top of your screen there, five goals, 13 on Friday night. They've now got five of their last six seasons. Their lowest score of the season has come in a final. I feel like we speak about this every year. It's, it's Groundhog Day on this on this show. Now, they were good enough last year to bounce back and be 15 points up in the grand final. It doesn't feel like it's the same side, though, does it? I mean, no Stewart. He was hobbling on a walking stick across the ground after the final siren. He's not coming back. I know he travelled with them. Two is a big omission. They just don't seem the same powerful unit. There's another year and legs into um, and miles into Seld and Dangerfield's a bit older. He looks banged up and is not the player that we know that he is. So it doesn't feel like they're going to be capable of, of doing what they did last year with the age and, and the situation that this group's in. And this time around, Kane, going into a semi-final, they haven't had the week off leading into the game. Correct. So they've been going right now for 10, 11, 12 weeks heading into this semi-final when they play the Giants next week. Gary Rowan, another disappointing final from him. Just the two handballs in the first half. Here are those uh, touches. And they were forced to throw him behind the footy uh, after half time. Yeah, unfortunately, some players' reputations are built in finals. And we've spoken about Oliver and Petrarca and and Aaliyah. Some players aren't. So this is the, the Telstra new graphic here that we've got. Only two of his possessions were going towards Geelong's goal. So the yellow ones there are going from the back line. They were forced, as I said, to put him on a lear. From there, he was rattled. And just before halftime, they moved him back behind the ball and clearly it didn't work. Yeah, the new AR Stats Tracker, you can get that on the updated AFL Live official app. Powered by Telstra Kane. All of the stats, disposals, you can see where they're taken on the ground. It's a great new feature for the finals. Gary Rowan getting so many of his balls behind uh, from the defensive half. That's so unlike him uh, for the Cats. Just one quickly... On the power, Mitch Georgiatis misses with that hamstring. Orazio Fantasia was the inclusion, provided he gets up for the preliminary final. Who makes way, if at all, uh, for Mitch Georgiatis? I don't think anyone is heartbreaking as it is. And um, you know, whilst he's got such a massive future and he's going to be a very good player, Mitch Georgiatis, 32 goals here. He's been, he's been a young star. I can't wait to watch him. I just think what Todd Marshall does, not necessarily with the ball, but his off-ball stuff, um, really impresses Port Adelaide. Ken Hinkley's a massive fan. And if you look forward to, say they progress to the grand final, it's Melbourne, which is the way that it's set up. Melbourne looks so vulnerable when the ball hits the ground against the smalls, not necessarily against the tall. So there's no way you could play Melbourne in the grand final with four talls. So I think they'll go with Dixon, Laddams and Marshall. Okay. And unfortunately, young Mitch Georgiades might have to sit and wait and, and maybe if there's an injury, he may get an opportunity. Jeez, that'd be a massive call after almost 40 goals this season for Mitch Georgiades. One game left in this first week of finals. It is the right to play Brisbane next week at the Gabba. Kane, the Dogs and the Bombers, so much riding on it for the Western Bulldogs. Still haven't won a final since that grand final breakthrough in 2016. We wanted to take a look at the Essendon side from their last final in 2019. Only 10 players remaining in black there that were played in that side two seasons ago. It was pandemonium in the off-season when their three guns decided they were going to leave. It felt like the walls at Windy Hill were coming in or Tullamarine where they are now. It's not the case. They've just been... Once again, Ben Rutten lost his first two this season. The pressure was coming on the succession plan. They're playing with house money tomorrow. Like no, no, absolutely nothing to lose. The Bulldogs are the team under the most pressure coming to this finals. It's, as we spoke about, one of the great missed opportunities on top of the ladder after round 20. Their performance against Port Adelaide last week. Now not playing at home. You'd think all the support will be for the Bombers down in Tassie. I think they'll be too good. I, I think the Western Bulldogs will make a statement, but there is absolutely nothing to lose. And even if the West, if Essendon put in a good performance but lose, it's been a, a big win and a massive development year for the Bombers to launch into 2022. Sam Draper got hold of them last time from the clearances. Let's see how it goes. No uh, definitive Ruckman this week if Tim English plays forward again for the Dogs. Kane, I'll see you same time play, same place here on the round so far next week as we break down the semi-finals. Good on you, Mitch. See you next week.